A ray of light is enough to lighten the darkest of temples, and the voice of reason is enough to calm a frenzied mass. Few have lost their balance and steadied again. Few have retained their sight. The king of the jungle takes his time for a single strike. His patience outweighs his might. To open a new door, old ones must not be closed. But to open a new heart, the mind must first be prepared. PTV World. Keep sight of your goal. In chaos and confusion, we need wisdom to guide us. In moments of despair, we need hope to strengthen us. In times of uncertainty, we need knowledge to inform us. And for all this, we need a source worthy of our trust. PTV World, building trust beyond news. Assalamu alaikum. You're watching Changing Times and I'm Dr. Zubair Ghori. The Syrian crisis that has been, we that we have been talking about, about the civil war that is going on and the terrorist activities and the people are standing regime has given birth to a yet another crisis not only for the region but for the international community as well here I mean to say that the refugees that are going out of the country out of Syria they are trying to reach Europe this way or that way they are taking illegal means but once they are reaching there that has given birth to another crisis for the European community and that is the European refugee crisis and some people are calling it also the immigration crisis you might have observed the picture of that small child who was uh, was dead and washing at the shores of Turkey that was one big indicator of this development that has really shaken the world to the core that has been uh, taken into account by the international community from the uh, right from the Eastern Europe to the Western European side and now everybody is talking about giving shelter to these refugees giving them uh, uh, some of the rights that they deserve and but they are not talking about the real problem they are not considering the fact that why they have been forced to leave their lands of course this immigration crisis is a part of this whole discussion but we have to delve deep into this issue and look at the Middle Eastern crisis we have to talk about ISIS we have to talk about the role of the um, of the Middle Eastern elders particularly Saudi Arabia Syria Egypt and also Jordan and maybe the UAE why they are contributing into this crisis why they are not helping them out and why the international community is taking a silent leap on this whole problem that we are facing at the moment. So we, there are a host of issues that we will be talking about. Let me introduce you to the guest I have. I have Dr. Akab Malik. He is teaching in National Defense University and he is talking about international affairs. Uh, doctor, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. And we are also joined by uh, Dr. Bakr Najmuddin. He has been working on international affairs and particularly the politics of Europe. Bakr, thank you very much for joining us. Right. So, Akab, how do you uh, summarize the whole thing? Is it just the immigration crisis or is something there? I think for me, it is the tail that is wagging the dog. <coughs> I think you need to look at the origins of the, the whole crisis, which is, uh, stems from the Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. Essentially, uh, the idea was that the Arab Spring was supposed to bring about, the, the hope was that it was supposed to bring about a lot of positive change. Mm -hmm. um, However, you have vested interests, you have strategic interests from different countries around uh, that region, in the region and around the world to change particular dynamics and mm -hmm. political dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which interfered in that, uh, that change and didn't allow it to occur. Um, and that has caused a lot of crisis because the, the action, reaction effect and the continuous downward spiral into conflict mm -hmm. in that region mm -hmm. has destroyed many lives and the situation has changed so much so that nobody knows really what is going on on yeah. the ground. Yeah. Especially with the, <coughs> the arrival of uh, 
the Islamic State, for example, mm -hmm. other groups, Al Nusra Front, uh, <coughs> the Free Syrian Army disappeared, yeah. for example. Nobody knows where they've gone. In fact, they've joined these other militant groups to have more strategic effect because they're not working as well mm -hmm. <coughs> against uh, Bashar Assad and the Syrian Army. And when you have Western or Eastern or any external interference from mm -hmm. the outside for their own vested interests, mm -hmm. like we did in Afghanistan during the 1990s when the Mujahideen were fighting each other, a proxy war mm -hmm. uh, emerged to destroy the country. Okay. And this is exactly the same reoccurrence of history mm -hmm. that is happening in Syria and in Libya, where yeah. there was external interference of some uprising to take uh, take out, you could say, uh, um, the existing Gaddafi, regime, yeah. existing regime um, that changed the dynamics of the whole situation yeah. for other interests rather than the interests of the people on the ground in those countries. So how it has contributed to the to development of a bigger crisis of refugees or the immigration crisis? Well, if you, you see like what's, if you see what's happening in Libya, if you see what's happening in, in Iraq and Syria, mm -hmm. you'll notice that the countries are virtually destroying themselves from mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. uh, and from without. Okay. People need to live. Mm -hmm. If you're living in an environment and you grow up in an environment that you know is your history, your, your childhood, mm -hmm. your future, you mm -hmm. could say, and it's all destroyed in front of you, your friends, your family, yeah. are either killing each other or dying as mm -hmm. a result, it brings about a national trauma at every level. Mm -hmm. And when you have a national trauma at every level, and there's no future, no hope, yeah. no need for existence, and you tra traumatize yourself as an individual, mm. what options do you have? Mm. Where you can't see any future for existence, you want to get out. Mm. And then we have to look at how this occurred I mean, it's not a matter of a blame game, yeah. but those people or those countries that took part in this conflict, mm. that exacerbated this conflict, mm. must take responsibility. Okay, let me go on to uh, Bakr. Bakr, is, is it really the, the fixation of the responsibility, the matter here, that we should talk about the people or the countries who have exacerbated this crisis, or we have to see the, 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 the end at the moment that is going on, the refugee crisis that is going on in the Eastern, and the, particularly in Germany, and we are also now talking about Paris and uh, in the UK that the refugees are going there as well. First and foremost, I need to mention and kind of uh, support the view of Dr. Saab that the whole crisis has to be given an historical analysis mm. for the very fact that the invasion of Iraq accentuated the whole crisis. Mm. I think the beginning of this crisis has, uh, has to go back to 2003 or 2001 when uh, Iraq was invaded. Mm -hmm. uh, relatively, the region was peaceful before the invasion of Iraq. Mm -hmm. But quite unfortunate, after the demise of uh, Saddam and the old Middle East got into confusion, so the Ula Balu in the Middle East should not be blamed on the stupid, so to say, uh, the ineffectiveness of the leadership in the Middle East. Rather, mm. we need to look at the external interference mm. that have exacerbated this whole crisis. Mm. Otherwise, uh, Syrians were living in a, in, a, in a very luxurious life before the invasion. Mm. The Iraqis were living in a better life before the invasion. The Libyans were living one of the best life in Africa before the invasion. How do you define this, this best life? Uh, because the invaders or the so-called people who attacked them, they said, we are going to give them liberty. We are going to give them the free life. They were under suppression. You talk about the, 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 the Kurds and the, and the Shias during the Saddam Hussein regime. They were, they were crying for help. Uh, th there is a question of who this defined liberty. Mm -hmm. How did you define it? Is it internally defined or externally defined? Mm -hmm. So is it an imposed liberty or a sort of self uh, realize liberty. So mm -hmm. the question here is that when you look at the societies in Middle East and North Africa, you find some sort of uh, peaceful environment. Mm. I, I'm taking an example of Libya uh, coming from Africa. I do understand, I do know mm. how the Libyans, they regarded uh, Gaddafi not as a leader, rather they regarded him as a father. They used to call him the father of the nation mm -hmm. because Gaddafi never saw them as just ordinary citizen. They were referred to as family. Mm -hmm. And as uh, on record, I want to say, if you go to Libya today, even before the demise of Gaddafi, Gaddafi used to say, I will never build a house for my parents if the Libyan citizen don't have a shelter. Okay. 
So yeah. health facilities are there for the Libyans, uh, free scholarship are there for the Libyans before the invasion of Libya. And that is also the case with Iraq before the invasion of no, Iraq. You, you, are, yeah. you, you, are, you are discounting the problems of the Kurds and the Shias during Saddam regime. Uh, I'm uh, not privy to, uh, to, to uh, the I, 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 I would want to say that this was kind of accentuated by the external forces. It's, it's a kind of divide and rule. Okay, let, me, let me give a, get, a, get a point of view uh, from Akab. Akab do, you, do you agree with this point of view that uh, during the Saddam regime there were no atrocities or no, there were no uh, I, I never said there was no atrocities. Or, I never said so. Or there were not of that much magnitude that invited the inf international, uh, international intervention? Let, let's not get it wrong. Mm. There was no real resolution for the invasion of yeah. Iraq. Yeah. So the international community was not in agreement with this. Mm -hmm. uh, by far and large, <coughs> to the large uh, countries in Europe, uh, mm. for example, yeah. France and Germany were absolutely against this. Mm. So it was... Uh, <coughs> the uh, British and, and the US Essentially, campaign. with a, a few coalition tr uh, countries mm. that they more or less got together mm. through inducement incentives uh, to invade a country to finish off what they should have they thought they should have done in, in the 1991. Yeah. Yeah. And <coughs> let, let's look at it this way. 1991, whatever happened in Kuwait and the United States and the international community went in to take Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait mm. was one thing. Mm -hmm. But that war didn't stop. Yeah. It continued on a lower level and then it finalized and it continues now. Mm. The difference is here that different interests came to the fore. Mm. More vested interests, oil understanding the, all the dynamics at play in Iraq were very different from what they are in Libya. But there are certain similarities. However, with Saddam Hussein, you're right. He was a tyrant. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't allow a uh, large percentage of the population a certain amount of freedoms. Mm -hmm. uh, he dominated. Um, but let's come to the fore and look at um, 2015, 12 years later, Mm. the state of the country in Iraq. Yeah, it's in now, turmoil. And we'll understand that maybe eventually, in the distant future, something may came, come about. We've, we've lost a generation more mm -hmm. of development yeah. in that country, primarily because of external interference of vested interests. Okay, how do you relate this development in Iraq? Well, we know that there was something happening as far as ISIS is concerned because they were anti uh, the present government that is uh, working in, in Iraq. But how do you relate with the Syrian situation? There were the days, heydays of Mr. Assad and then the Bashar al-Assad, and suddenly what happened? I think, I think you, you look at what happened in Iraq. Uh, um, I don't really appreciate talking about sectarianism mm. in the way most people do because I understand it very differently. It's more about vested interests, utilizing mm. populations for yeah, your own yeah, personal benefits, yeah. and the leadership does But eventually that. they, they, they but, take the tone of sectarianism. But, but that's what happens, uh, unfortunately, because most people uh, fall into that trap. Um, unfortunately, Maliki, who was the uh, yeah. um, president in, or prime minister in, in Iraq, he didn't uh, use his powers to the greatest effect for the benefit of the whole of Iraq and all the citizens of Iraq. Okay. He sidelined the Sunnis, uh, which felt betrayed to an extent that, fine, Saddam Hussein had gone. Yeah. Uh, they were at the height during Saddam Hussein. Now they felt yeah. that they were being used and there, there was a revenge factor in mm -hmm. that. So there's a certain form of rebellion to that, and there's mm. a certain form of revenge to what mm. now the Shias were doing. Mm -hmm. Rather than coming back and uh, taking power um, and using it for the benefit of the whole of Iraq, mm -hmm. there was a lot of sectarian divide increased by Maliki's government. Mm -hmm. And as a result, and this is well known, uh, and as a result, you had um, one of the biggest mistakes that the U.S. made was to disband the Iraqi Ba'athist army, mm. who are predominantly the leadership of ISIS or the yeah. Islamic State. Yeah, right? at the moment. So yeah. I question their religious incentives primarily because Ba'athist officers were not very religious, primarily mm. because Ba'athism is more socialistic and communist in orientation, right, right. which is atheistic. Mm. So I question ISIS and their foundations, but they may use religious mm. ideology for to recruit. Okay. As well. Okay. So there's a difference. Well, well Bakr, if, if, you, if you put it this way, that there was the international uh, intervention that has really kick-started this whole process. But if you look at the situation, then the role of Saudi Arabia, the role of Egypt, the role of Jordan, maybe of UAE, even silence is a crime in this situation. But they were even helping and abetting the people who were trying to increase the turmoil. Yeah, I do agree with that, that these external uh, forces within the region or these regional contexts 
uh, also tells us why this crisis continues to become uh, a kind of uh, a plague for the Muslim Ummah. Yeah, it's a plague, and, yeah. Uh, I used to ask myself a question. Where is the concept of Ummah hmm. at this junction? And how does the Middle Eastern countries, the Gulf countries, despite their richness, open their door to these refugees? Mm -hmm. One, we can understand that they are kind of, they have this phobia mm -hmm. that if we allow these uh, refugees to come into our country, yeah, yeah. this would also kind of aggravate our mm -hmm. own tension. Mm -hmm. Number one. Exporting of extremism. Exporting yeah. of extremism. This might be the underlying argument, but yeah. that is not the real argument. Mm -hmm. The most important would be the economic uh, pressure on no, their country. The, 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 uh, for my understanding, this, this economic uh, document mm. or the economic argument is taking the garb to cover the, their, their sentiments against militancy the, or that, extremism. Mm. But the situation is this. Uh, it, it again goes back with this uh, old debate. Why do we allow the West or why do we allow the external forces to decide our fate? Mm -hmm. And this is how we have to understand the phenomena of ISI. Mm -hmm. That when you look at the debate or the discourse of ISI, ISI is not just simply against the established. Sorry, yeah. uh, ISI. <laughs> uh, ISIS is not simply against the um, uh, the regime in the Middle East. Yeah. It's looking at the old Western. Yeah phenomena. Yeah. When you look at the argument that we want to re redraw the boundary that was drawn after the First World War. Mm -hmm. So it is not as if uh, um, ISI, uh, sorry, yes. ISS is uh, trying to... You better call it only IS. Obviously, um, I, I'm not against the... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the, the Islamic State have to be given a, a kind of civil society discuss. Mm. Why do I say that? They see themselves as the freedom fighters. Mm. That we are trying to push away. Just as the Mujahideen in Afghanistan says, we're trying to push away. No, what, what, what are they trying to portray themselves by public beheadings and floggings and uh, having the human markets there? So people are getting more and more wary against their practices. They don't want to come into the main fora. And, and that is the mistake. And that is the mistake of the Taliban. Perhaps that, that's how they, they are. Uh, that's uh, not a mistake. It, it, no, no, no. It, it is a mistake. It is a mistake in the sense that they fail to understand how civil society works. Yeah. yeah awesome. They fail to understand. Because as a civil society, you need to have the techniques of mobilizing the people. No, and look, at, look at this, Bakr. If you're talking about that these are the elders of the Saddam regime who have eventually joined this uh, not, Baghdadi entirely, clan. not entirely N not entirely but they are people they must be knowing what they have been doing with Saddam Hussein they must be knowing what is the Western or the modern style of thinking we, you can't live with the human market yes. so what they are trying to portray here I'm not I'm not trying to go against their policies but I'm not taking this that they are so naive that they don't understand how that works today and at the same time I'm not being the devil advocate yeah. I'm not advocating <laughs> for that what I'm simply looking at it is the sense of civil society mm and the sense of trying to resist the external intervention. Mm. Uh, I would say Islamic State is not entirely the former Batix regime. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an amalgam it's of so many yeah, things. It's an amalgam yeah. of so many things, mm -hmm. so many forces. Mm -hmm. And we do not have a concrete evidence to mm. suggest mm. that this is exact picture of Islamic okay. State. L look, at, look at Syria once again. I'll try to bring you back out of the, the jaws of IS in, in Iraq. Look at the Syrian situation. Many people say that this is the cruel policies of Bashar al-Assad who have literally ignited the whole process. The Al-Nusra Front, all the free Syrian army has gone uh, for the moment at least. But this is the this is the blowback from the people that you keep on oppressing them, uh, repressing them, and then they have to bounce back at you. Well, there's no there's no doubt. Uh, the dictation dictatorships uh, have um, a cut off date. Yeah. There's a cutoff date now. Um, if ever every, every, everywhere in the world, I reckon that, especially because of the height of the media, social media, people uh, have more awareness mm. of their surroundings and what their their rights could be. Mm -hmm. And people want this when mm. they see examples of what's happening around the world and what they can acquire. Mm. They they want this, this themselves, and then they talk about it and then build a consensus on the population. When the Arab Spring came in, in Syria, I think it was very unique, but it was very much in demand and it mm -hmm. was needed there. Mm -hmm. 
However, it was taken advantage of. Mm. Now, the trouble in Iraq was arising, arising. The United States had left officially in 2008 when they, when they, when yeah. they completed their operations. And Maliki's government was in charge and he was using the wrong policies. Mm. And he disaffected a large section of those policies, especially the Sunni Muslims and the former insurgents. Uh, and there was a lot of people from the death squads who had yeah. a lot of blood on their hands mm -hmm. who went to, uh, and considered something else. When they saw Syria erupt, this is another front. Mm. This is another front because mm. boundaries may be there in official guys which were divided after the First World War and Second World War, for example. But these were artificial boundaries. Yeah. These people had commonalities with each other, not just the yeah. culture and religion and families. Yeah. So they had a relationship with each other. And it just went across a so-called international border. Mm. Um, and that's what happened. Mm. So the ISIS filled that gap, that vacuum that was created by, mm. uh, by Bashar al-Assad because he wasn't able to provide mm. what the people wanted. Mm. We also have to look at how ethnic politics plays its part mm. and sectarian politics plays its part where, where in Syria the Alawites are mm. a very small minority yeah. ruling over majority Sunni population. So now you have a reversal of the issue. Okay, yeah. let me just go on to the, the real thing that is happening in, in Eastern Europe, particularly we are talking about here uh, the Hungarian policies and also the, the, the German policies. Uh, are, are, they really, are they really painting themselves as very generous and magnanimous people that now they are opening up their hands, everybody mm -hmm. is praising Angela Merkel that look at she is the, she is the real hero of the humanity or there is something uh, underneath lurking there? Uh, let me begin to say that uh, the German uh, strategy have always been to keep a low profile. Mm -hmm. uh, Germany, since the end of the Second World War, never wanted to take the leadership of, European, of the whole continental Europe for basic reasons. But however, the date and the publicized uh, picture of that uh, um, Iraqi, or is it, uh, Iraqi or Syrian Yeah, uh, it's just the, the Syrian war, child, uh, yeah. I think change the whole equation mm. about this humanitarian crisis, one. Yeah. But one more important thing is that we don't expect Hungary or the Eastern European countries to open the door to these refugees mm. because of their own economic crisis. Mm. At the moment, the EU or the Eurozone is facing uh, what I call the economic trauma. Mm. So they are yet to get out of the trauma. And so you don't expect them in a, uh, on a very rational uh, ground. You don't expect but, but them to you, open the ground. If you, if you listen to the talks given by different uh, refugees or the refugee mm -hmm. uh, or the aspirant immigrants, they ultimately want to reach either France or Germany. They don't want to live in Austria uh, or maybe simply in, because in they know. Yeah. Simply because Why they know that, that Western that Europe, Western Europe is more wealthy than the Eastern European countries, mm -hmm. and perhaps because of the kind of regimes in this country, uh, these. There is a growing trend of nationalism going on in these countries, mm. and we have lesser of nationalism and patriotism sentiment in Western Europe okay. as compared to Eastern Europe. Yeah, but, uh, uh, you, you, you are vigorously well, shaking your well, head. Well, I disagree. Um, I think there, there is a, an economic uh, divide between Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Definitely. There's no doubt about that. But you also look at the political economy there. You've got to look at the attitudes of people there. They're slightly more progressive in their attitudes towards people and humanitarian affairs. The systems are built more on social welfare. That's very important. No, haven't you haven't you seen the recent rise in Germany, the Islamophobia well, that, campaign? That was Islam, that was Islamophobia. That was a reaction to what yeah. was going on in the world. That was a not not uh, a direct. Aren't they, aren't they reacting that, that to was this, a, this? Not a direct direct reaction in any way whatsoever to the refugee crisis. That was more. No, uh, they were previously well, handling. That, 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 that was a more liberal. That, that that was a more more reaction to uh, the, uh, the 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 attitude the effect, of the Turk Muslims that are living there. Not just the Turks, because uh, actually, when you look at the Germans, mm -hmm. the majority population that is Muslim in Germany is Turkish. Yeah, and the type of Turks that went to Germany. No, my, my question yeah, is, when you are saying, you when you are there, saying the Germans talking. are more liberal, kind of, I, I, I still find and, that and they, taking a lighter view of the I, things. I, no, Why didn't they take a lighter take, view of the Turk Muslims? You've got a minority taking the highlight in the media. And they, they're having rights, but you look at Angela Merkel and a lot of the leadership, most mm. of the leadership, and then the population went out to, to go against that's this what, rising That's what, that's what I'm trying to racism. understand, what the yeah. politics is going on. We've got to recognize that there's small minorities that take media attention, and people think the whole country's changing, like you've got the EDF that's disbanded yeah. virtually in England. Yeah? Because they no longer, no, uh, no longer recognize, and there are those people who are not so educated, no. working class. One, one last who, thing. Who one last to, thing. We want to uh, before I go to Bakr. No, no, one last thing before I go uh, to Bakr. Do you think the the Syrian 
refugees or the aspiring immigrants are are so much understanding the political dynamics in Eastern and Western Western Europe before deciding their final status? I think what more what is more important is that when you've got a more a more defined, fairer system of governance in a particular country which recognize and if you look at England for example, mm -hmm. I believe mm -hmm. even now, even after all the problems that occurred in England, that it's probably the most liberal country in the world. Yeah. There's a reason for that. I can go there and say what I want. Mm -hmm. And nobody can put me in prison or uh, use violence against me. There are there is an increase in violence against Muslims by seventy percent increase, for example. Yeah. Um, but they're minorities and there are local people, uh, uneducated people and racists uh, which are minorities. Okay, I'm not talking about England. What, what, mm -hmm. yeah. what, what I want to talk about here is the fact that <coughs> When somebody sees there's a welfare state, they see that they can get benefits, and they see there's a, a, yeah, a government the with, with rules, here's the point. A government here's with the point. rules the, the that say state. that they, they can achieve asylum, and there are loopholes there. People can take advantage of that okay. and have a better life. Okay, but do you agree with this that there are more welfare state, and there are loopholes, and there are more humanitarian towards the asylum seekers, or there are uh, some uh, economic factors as well? I think there are yeah. two sides to that. When we speak of refugees in the old continental Europe. Uh, you would better talk about the Nordic countries or Scandinavian countries. Mm -hmm. So why the Nordic countries are not opening their doors to these refugees? Yeah. This is a big question. So if we talk about... They're the richest. Yeah, they're the richest. And in terms of social uh, securities... Yeah. They're more liberal. They're more liberal than the... Smaller the economies. But smaller. Oh, they're smaller. not smaller economy. Come on. <laughs> <Compared to laughs> they, they're, they're, France they're and Germany, they're, they're very much smaller economy. They, can't, so they are. They can't sustain. But I, in, in comparison so with Hungary and Austria, they're so big one, economies. They, they so are to an extent, but so look at the difference one, between wouldn't the root force. Why, why don't they go to Nordic countries? Look at the distance. Okay. The if you are able to reach <laughs> Hamburg, why can't you go to <laughs> up but north? That's another point, another point, another point. You've got to look so at the no, human my, my basic question was, why their target is Germany? Why aren't they stopping in Austria, I don't think in there's Italy, a in Greece? There's no, 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 no form of conspiracy. No, no, it's the no, minds of the people no. who have gone there already. The they, have gone there they don't have the, the information. There is a proximity to this. Okay. There is a proximity, a proximity debate to this. So when you look at Austria, Hungary, and Germany, Austria is very proximate to Germany. So that's the next next door. Next door for them to no. Go why in. not? Why not? They are stopping in but Italy or maybe at Greece. No, no, that's a far place to go. Yeah. So you either but come they keep to the on their journey. Greece okay. Why don't you stop at Egypt? <laughs> why don't they go to Turkey? There are the closer places. Oh, that's if the they are coming out of Syria. That is a question of where is the concept of Humma? No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just asking that these refugees who are trying to find their next home, mm -hmm. why aren't they stopping at the nearest possible place? Why no, are they going for the best of the best? They have the choice. I want to go to the, the UK. I want to go to Germany. They are humans, and they can use their rational choice. No. So it means, it means that they are not going for the for the immediate possible thing. They are losing lives. They are losing their children. They are losing their families. But they eventually want to reach the best of the best. And because they have lost, so a this lot. is not a humanitarian because crisis. Because they then. have they have lost a lot. So you you wouldn't want them to lose two things at the same time. One, mm. they left their homes. I may be I may be sounding a bit curt. <laughs> Yeah. I get your point completely. Mm, yeah. I understand yeah. why why they are going for the absolute best rather than yeah. get for the immediate needs because they're getting out of a war. Yeah, they are going to a local just environment. So maybe Egypt. Well, let's look at it this way: Turkey and Egypt, uh, uh, two Muslim countries. Yeah, so they they have had a dream of something better in the West. Yeah, the opportunities there, the the lack of repression, for example, that they receive. And Turkey is, by the way, one of the biggest refugee. Uh, oh, well, Turkey is um, probably the most aggressive I'm Muslim country I'm there is. Yeah, and I think There's that's no a about that. mistake. The Syrians have settled a lot in Turkey. Mm. I, I was in Turkey just mm. uh, a few weeks ago. They have settled a lot They have settled Turkey. a lot who are close to the northern border, mm -hmm. who have been affected by the ISIS. Mm -hmm. But the people who are fleeing through the sea, and they know that this is a horrendous journey of maybe Fine. of mm -hmm. weeks, why aren't they stopping to the nearest beaches? So, w we cannot generally call it humanitarian crisis. Mm -hmm. It is, in, in the language of international law, it will be seen as humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. because they have to flee from their home yeah. because of the crisis over there. But beneath it, mm -hmm. there are lots of other dimensions to that. Mm -hmm. Economic dimension, mm -hmm. social dimension, political dimension, as you might have read. No, but I am asking, mm -hmm. if I have to sacrifice my family oh. at the expense of reaching the best place on earth, should I do that? Then First, should I be considered as a humanitarian crisis? There is a many humanitarian <laughs> crisis that's been taken advantage of. That's what you're trying to say. Mm. Yeah. I agree, with, I agree with that to, to an extent. Now, you're a father. You have children. You've yeah. got a wife. You've got a maybe elders with you. Yeah. And you're trying to get them across. You see no future uh, in where you are. 
you had in your mind something something further mm -hmm. you don't even have in your mind something like Greece because it's going through a crisis itself Hungary is not so much exporting its culture environment yeah you may I have, have, have it, but you see something in your mind it depends I have read a story I have I have read a story about yeah. there are so many uh, very 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 tragic detail that are coming I have read a story that that he started the journey with a wife and four children he lost some one child somewhere near Egypt Mm. He lost the second child somewhere near in Sicily, mm. and he lost the third child somewhere near uh, Austria. So why he is keep he, he keeps on losing his things? Why can't he settle down at one the first available slot? Uh, That's the, a personal the, decision you're going to have to discuss with that person yeah, who did that. Okay. Actually, because I can't so see what is in his mind. The the but question when the large is population this. does this, what, okay. what pushed them out of their country? We know yeah, that. Yeah, push them out. We, we do understand mm. that. But if I am under stress. So, okay, let's move on to the, the other neighboring countries. What about Saudi Arabia? Why aren't they opening their borders for them? Why are they asking 200 mosques to be built in Germany for the refugees who are going there? At the moment, we have 500,000 Syrians living in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. according to the uh, uh, Humanitarian Department, United mm -hmm. Nations. So, are, are, the, are, the, are these the direct outcome of this, the present no, crisis no, or no, the previously no, no, settled? No, no, no. There are people who settled there. No, who settled, settled, who settled. Stages, yeah. Yeah. So, and Saudi Arabia is not a signatory of yeah. the, the UN refugee things. So you find out that there's a new dimension to that. But the other question is, what about no, the Don't tell me country? about this bureaucratic <laughs> thing that <they're> not a, <laughs> they are not a signatory <laughs> to that. They can they're not, anybody they're not, the soil. They're not. So Saudi Arabia has always been very much sensitive. So when you look at the graph of the expatriates, even expatriates, I'm talking of expatriates now in different Gulf countries. Saudi Arabia I hope is the you're least. not carrying a bag for king. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope the king no, 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 has the argument. There's a valid point here. Yeah. So Why isn't Saudi Arabia, Dubai, Qatar, Bahrain taking yeah. people in? Yeah. They're the richest co economies in yeah. that region. In that region. They've got the money to accommodate, even if it's for a short to period. To an extent, even Jordan can uh, take it. Jordan can. And it's they have, a lot. They Jordan have, have, have taken a lot. And it's a polar yes. country, yeah. so uh, Jordan is doing yeah, what it can. And there's a Polish border and a lot of people have gone yeah. across there already. But why not the others? Mm. Now, you'll say, uh, Sadia says, uh, this is more counterterrorism issues. I don't think so. I don't think they want to take anything. You just mentioned they want to pay, pay for 200 mosques in, mm. in Germany. Yeah. The Germans are worried that this is uh, Islamization <laughs> of, <laughs> of Germany. Yeah. But a lot of these so-called conspiracy theories, some of them tend to have some truth behind it. Mm -hmm. Nothing comes out of nowhere. There's no vacuum there. There's well, always something if you, there. If you, if, you look at, something. if you look at Pakistan, that we have been hosting around 3 million refugees for about 20, 30 years now. And uh, now the people are understanding that what is the cost of taking in the refugees. You, ha you have recently been to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to Europe and you have, been, you have been living there also. Do people appreciate this thing now since this thing is right on their borders? I don't think. I, you know, funny thing is, we haven't highlighted this issue lately, given that we've been through this problem for the last 30 plus years. Yeah. We should have highlighted it more, indicating what the costs and effects are. Yeah. Uh, especially yeah. when... And you're I worried about 4,000 people. Yeah. Look at 3 million people. 3 million plus, and we've had them for generations now. Yeah. Yeah. And there is an, a cost and effect. And actually, most of them, the younger generation that grew up here, born and brought up here, has become Pakistanis to an extent. But the difference is here that we're not highlighting it in this country so mm. much. Yeah. Not even in the international media? I don't really think we're doing enough about that to indicate this is what the problems are, this is what happens, and this is the cost that is going to occur there. Mm -hmm. But it, our economies are not like the Western economies either. Yeah. But, but let, let's, look, let's look at it this way. Um, well, let's go back to the Gulf. Mm. Um, people come in, they may see, because they're closer to us, they mm. may see what the, the, the effect may be yeah, because of what happened in Pakistan. But we took them in because we also made a decision to resist Soviet occupation yeah. of Afghanistan. Yeah. So, yeah. so we made a, a decision to take people in because that was the effect that was going to occur why because we made a decision okay. to fight against them. Because why can't the, the, the UAE or the Gulf states, they take a decision on this because they are the closest then. They could have traveled to this period, uh, part of the world if economy is the reason. Uh, I think the simple answer would be this one is the social pressure. The social pressure is always there and the population exposure is always there. So you look at this uh, these countries, they have a very small population. And so you're opening the door for these refugees to come. They're kind of having this fear. Demographics. Of, 
Yeah. Demographic explosion, and, and I think it why, is can't, a why can't then the it Europeans is, have this yeah. demographic explosion? Uh, because uh, even in, in they, they are the Arabs mm -hmm. largely. They they speak the same language. They share the similar feelings and the cultures. They will be aliens in the Eastern or the Western economies. Why can't they come over here if the doors are open? I, I do agree with that, and that is the uh, the failure of our Muslim policies or the Islamic world. So I repeat the word where is the concept of Hummah mm -hmm. in this old dimension. Mm. And, uh, By the way, where is oh, I <laughs> see. It exist. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, I see. This is the fantasy that people live in. Mm. It doesn't exist. The, since the international state system came about, mm. Ummah finished. Mm. The whole idea of Ummah is negated by international state system. Okay. And, and a propagation of the international state system by these Gulf countries, by the Muslim countries to maintain their borders, mm -hmm. actually absolutely detrimental to the idea of Ummah. So when somebody okay, talks about we will, we will, we will <laughs> continue this, this discussion, ladies and gentlemen, but it's a time for a very short break. And when we come back, we will be discussing some, uh, some of the elements that we have not yet touched. Please take a break. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We have been talking about the Syrian uh, civil war and the crisis that has uh, given birth to international refugee and immigration crisis, particularly in the eastern uh, part of Europe that may be spreading over to the Western Europe as well. Let's continue our discussion. We have been talking about the Pakistani role and we have been doing all this for the Afghans and, and that was a conscious decision made by our own part. But we have not been highlighting this thing. So is it is it perhaps the point that uh, perhaps the time that we, we, we restart our efforts to tell the people that we need more help in this conflict situation? I think, I think the countries that are taking in the refugees are the ones who are going to highlight it more than us. Because mm -hmm. we're coming through the issue after 30 years plus. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've highlighted it enough mm -hmm. in this current uh, environment of uh, migrant crisis, which is in Europe predominantly. Yeah. Not in this region, yeah. by the way. But perhaps this is the time that we may re re start you, our I mean, but when we raise this circumstance that we've suffered from this and we made a, made a decision to take mm. people in, mm -hmm. and they're still refugees, by the way, yeah. under the law. Um, and Although after, most of them have become Pakistan nationals. They've become Pakistan nationals. They're contributing to the economy. They're making businesses. They've got educated here, taking jobs, etc. So contributing to the economy. And on top of that, a lot of the refugees who have gone back, mm. went back to Afghanistan with skills mm. that they couldn't acquire because of the conflict environment in Afghanistan, which means they're contributing to the economy in Afghanistan. Yeah. So the direct impact that Pakistan has had mm. is very positive. People don't look at that effect. Mm -hmm. But when we're looking at those people who go into Europe, mm. they're unlikely to go back unless yeah. a decision is made uh, for only keeping them for a particular period of time and then sending them back to rebuild their economy when the conflict environment yeah, that's subsides not a happen. little bit. Which is highly unlikely because yeah. the life there would be better than it will be in, mm -hmm. in city for a long time to come. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to highlight this to indicate what's happened, but that might also deter a lot of the European countries even more so. Okay, okay, but if you look at the, uh, the the European economies at the moment, and as we are expecting, that it's highly unlikely that people are going to go back. How do you see the the Eastern, particularly the Western Europe, if you're talking about France and UK, are they going to be affected in the longer run, or their social uh, makeup is going to be changed? Um, I feel the current crisis in the European zone will kind of becomes a deterrent. Mm -hmm against opening more door to mm. the refugees. This is okay. a very clear fact. Yeah. Uh, when you look at the southern part of Europe, they're already in a mess, economic mm -hmm. mess. Mm -hmm. The Eastern European uh, Union, uh, European members are not better off. Mm -hmm. Only for the Western Europeans. And with this continuing crisis going on, Europe will find itself in a big mess. Mm -hmm. And like I want to say, that we need to see this humanitarian crisis or this immigration crisis from an historical perspective. Yeah. That how how come Europe continues to open its door yeah. to foreigners? Yeah. So at one point cannot, in time, yes. at one point in time, they were seen as guest workers. Mm -hmm. At one point in time, they had an agreement with countries in even uh, Morocco, in in uh, in Middle East. So you find out that this current humanitarian crisis is 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 the next step. 
of immigration towards okay. Europe. Let's, let's try to look into the future for the moment. Mm. At least on the German street, we are seeing the people are coming out. They are welcoming them. They're giving food, flowers, blah, blah, blah. But do you really think that once they settle in, of course, they will be, exp uh, they will be doing their lives. They were, of course, doing their religious chores as well. And they may be also expressing their thoughts as well. So are you expecting in the next one or two years any more turmoil as for the politics of the region is concerned? Definitely, definitely. Because the question of radicalism is, is, is on bear. Mm -hmm. One. Number two, the rise of these rightist, nationalist, nativist is yeah. there. Number three is the economic crisis. So Europe has to manage itself constrained its humanitarian so-called mm -hmm. uh, welcoming these uh, refugees. Uh, so we want to say that uh, the door might be open to refugees, but the European policymakers will still go back to the indoor to find out how to manage this crisis. Because I believe Europe is not ready to commit the same mistake as they did in 1950s and the 1960s, yeah. where they welcome a lot of immigrants. Mm. But they were not prepared for them because they felt this immigrant should Are go they prepared this time? This is the same question. Either not. This is the same question. Yeah. They wouldn't fall into the same pit twice. Okay. Look, at, look at it this way. Look at, yeah. look at a circumstance that may occur. Hmm. Uh, I've, I've been reading reports and um, ISIS, whether it's highlighted or not, whether it's false or not, false propaganda uh, is another issue. But there could be an eventuality like this where certain people from ISIS are going over yeah. as refugees yeah. and then consolidate themselves mm. and attack those countries. Mm. Look at the impact that will have on the refugee crisis yeah. and the backlash it will have on those refugees who are really yeah. there to survive. And yeah. I think this is bound to happen. This I, I think it may, may well do. It's, so, it's only the so, so question of time when it's going so to happen. So the highly likely mechanism to stop that. The, the, yeah. Well, it's very difficult to stop that. To <laughs> you stop can't that. stop that you unless you've got mind-reading equipment, which is not there <laughs> at, all, at the moment, is it? So, so at the end of the day, what you're really talking about is you're going to take in a risk, and they're very much aware of that. No, this, so, uh, but this but very fact is, is deterring them to take a decision. No, no, but look, look at this then. Germany understanding the risk, Britain understanding the risk, other countries understanding the risk are still taking people on. Doesn't that show uh, a very humanitarian, humanitarian side to their countries? Especially, but don't you think that, that that these people who are going to be accommodated into the countries they will be under special eye under under these? No doubt they would. And why would you not? Why would you not? If it was coming to my country and I, I, I was there, I would keep an eye out. No, we have, a, we have a very open experience here. We but, don't but, want but, anybody. Uh, but, 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 but my point my, my point is, if we were doing that, I'd keep an eye on them. Okay. okay. I have an okay. inch. Yeah. I have an inch. My inch is this, that the European policymakers would not create the environment of settlement for these refugees. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, they will melt into the society? No. Okay. They are going to create a kind of environment, a kind of isolated environment for them, in a way to Can find, they sustain in that, a way to find a problem, to find a solution. No, they, to are, the they are not the there as, as, as criminals to to create a special facility for them. No, no, I don't. I'm not looking at it in that. Or Nazi some kind space. of ghetto no, no, that no. may be created. I, I think, I, I I think you're looking at looking at a situation what happened in the in the Second World War when the internment yeah. camps happened. In the United States, for the Japanese, for example, mm -hmm. when all the Japanese were interned into camps to keep an no, eye We're not looking at, at, at this scenario. I don't mean that, 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 that way. No, no, no. Well, what, 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 what's in your mind then? What are you expecting? There's some uh, uh, growth of some settlements here, like the Israelis had uh, for them? They're for not the going Jews? To, they wouldn't melt them with the society. I, you, what can't, else? you can't oppose that. It's going to happen by nature. It's going to happen. They, will f they need to find a solution mm -hmm. to the crisis in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. the, this is the cause, and we have to look at the cause. Otherwise, this whole crisis will continue to expand. That's what we are expecting at the moment, that this, this is going to happen. And one fine morning, we may listen to a terrorist attack in Berlin, maybe. And or then everything will then fall uh, into a mess and everybody starts looking at their budgets, military budgets and again. If, if and interfering happens, even more then. That's, yeah. a, that's a problem. But you're not going to be able to stop all these refugees from melting into the population. It's just going to be virtually impossible. If that happens, then you, you are going to see the European as ambivalent. Mm -hmm. On one hand, they are ready to accept. On the other hand, they are ready to close the door. Mm -hmm. so my, that's always been the case. So my hunch is this, that they wouldn't allow them to melt totally into the society they're going what are to, they going to do then they're going to facilitate them to a certain extent and find a solution to the crisis in the middle east this is the only best solution no, they are for not them. going to do it no because the stakes the are even middle east. higher no. in the middle east 
There's no been any solution in the Middle East. The Syrian crisis, the mm -hmm. crisis are the Syrian crisis and the Iraqis, because mm -hmm. these are the two countries. Yeah. The, the Middle East is such an explosive environment. That solution requires all regional countries, especially the Arab countries that are rich or not willing to get involved, wow. as well as other countries around the world to get involved in the Middle East. Yeah. And nobody is going to do that. Look at the American shift towards uh, East yeah. Asia and rebalancing strategy. They know they're hanging in the Middle East for the time being because they've got no choice. But they want to move away from this environment. They don't want to put okay. more resources into it. Okay, gentlemen, uh, one last thought from both of you. What do you see in future, maybe in few lines? It depends how far future you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Two years. Two years. I reckon this crisis is ongoing, but I think they're going to force parties to get on the ground. But... I don't think you're going to force an Islamic State to do anything. Okay, Bakr? Um, Two years I, I, down the road? Unless it's militarily done. Mm -hmm. the, the Europeans are going to find a way to bring in the United Nations into this crisis, and they are going to force the stakeholders in the Middle East so that this problem, because the economic crisis in Europe will mm -hmm. be a determinant factor. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bakar Najmuddin, and thank you very much, Akal Malik, for joining us on this uh, very interesting discussion that we had. But uh, this is the time for uh, retrospection, introspection, and also a lot of thinking on our own side. What are the Muslim countries are doing here? If there is anything that is that Bakar has talked about, uh, Muslim Ummah, the international community is responding to it this way or that way, rightly or wrongly. But we, what we are doing in the whole regional politics, the Arab politics and the non-Arab politics, are they really uh, concerned about the developments that are happening at this point in time or they really want to come out of this mess? What we have to do once this uh, crisis again spreads over to the eastern side, over to the Pakistani side or maybe into the western side and international community is very much looking into these things but what is our role? We have to think very, very clearly and positively. Your comments and suggestions are more than welcome at